I want to talk to you on this subject. I want to ask this question. Mom, who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? So on this Mother's Day, um, we want to ask that question. Who are you wearing? Generally speaking, when it comes to what you're wearing, some people are more concerned with fashion and some people are more concerned with function. Are you with me on this? Some are more concerned with fashion. That's the question of who are you wearing? And some people are more concerned with function. What is the purpose of what you're wearing? So now concerning fashion, you're worried more about the designer. The designer. If you've ever watched uh, an award show, you know that reporters will ask on the red carpet this question. Not what are you wearing, but who are you wearing? Who are you wearing? They'll yell out. And sometimes people will yell out Christian Dior or Prada or Versace or Ralph Lauren. Or if they'd asked me when I was growing up, uh, who are you wearing? I would have said Goodwill. All right. So or, uh, you know, I was so desperately wanted to wear something other than my uncle's hand-me-down clothes. All right. But that's kind of what I got stuck with. Uh, growing up. I don't know if you had to wear hand-me-downs or not, but uh, I always so much wanted to get, uh, now I, this shows kind of my age, but what I wanted was a shirt with an alligator on it. You remember those? Okay, that's what I wanted. I thought if I could just get me a shirt with an alligator on it, I would have made it. I, I would have been okay. And my mom, you know, bless her heart, uh, she wasn't really able to afford much of that kind of thing, and I think she did her best. She got me some shirts that were, well, what I would say are off-brand. Uh, I didn't ever have an alligator. I think I may have had a possum or, or something like that on my shirt, but my mom did the best that she could. Now, once again, if you're concerned about fashion, you're concerned about the designer. Now, if you're concerned about function, uh, then you're worried more about the performance of what you're wearing. So athletes will wear uh, garments that help them in their performance, right? You don't ever see a track star wearing a pair of cowboy boots when they're running. Why? Nothing wrong with cowboy boots, but that's not the function when they're there on the track running a race. Uh, you don't ever see a uh, fireman wearing a swimsuit, okay, because they've got to have something that's going to help them function when they're fighting a fire, right? You see what I'm saying? So uh, on the functionality side of things, uh, you're worried about what helps you perform at a higher level. Doctors wear scrubs. Firefighters wear fire repellent gear. Plumbers wear pants that show their butt crack. I'm not sure why, all right? I really am not sure why, but that seems to be a part of their uniform. But do you know that God asks the question? We, we said, Mom, who are you wearing? Do you know that God asks that same question? Who are you wearing? And we'll read this in the book of Ephesians today. The Apostle Paul used the metaphor of putting on Christ and taking off the old nature. Now, his question really was, showing this metaphor of how when it comes to living for Christ, when it comes to living the life that God has called us to live, there's some fashion that we got to take off and there's some function that we've got to put on. Just like you would put on a jacket, he says, you can wear those things that are going to help you be concerned about the designer and the functionality. Who is the designer? It's God himself. It's Jesus Christ. And also the functionality, which helps you to live the kind of life that God has called you to live. So let's read in Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll begin reading in verse number 20. And here's what Scripture says. With the Lord's authority, I say this, live no longer as the Gentiles do. Now remember, the Apostle Paul was the person writing this. And we believe under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it's Holy Scripture, it's God-breathed. And so he's telling his audience, he said, don't live the way the Gentiles do. Now, technically speaking, probably most of us in here are Gentiles. 
A Gentile is a, is a non-Jewish person, okay? But in this context, he was talking about being a non-believer. He wasn't saying that, uh, you know, live like a non-Jewish person. He was saying living as a person that doesn't know Christ. That's what he's saying, referring to unbelievers. He says, don't live like Gentiles do, for they are hopelessly confused. Sounds like he lives in this era that we live in, doesn't it? They're hopelessly confused. Their minds are full of darkness. They wander far from the life that God gives because they have closed their minds and hardened their hearts against him. They have no sense of shame. Isn't that true of a lot of people today? No sense of shame, no sense of right or wrong. They call good evil and evil good. And he says that's the way people live that are not followers of Jesus. They have not put on Christ, in other words. He says they live for lustful pleasure and eagerly practice every kind of impurity. But, he says, this isn't what you learned about Christ. Since you have heard about Jesus and have learned the truth that comes from him, throw off your old sin nature. In other words, just like you would throw off a dirty coat, a coat that was ill-fitting, a coat that you didn't need to be wearing. He says, throw it off. And uh, then he said, your, and your former way of life, which is corrupted by lust and deception, and instead let the Spirit, talking about the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, renew your thoughts and attitudes. You ever need that? You ever need the Holy Spirit to renew your thinking? How many times are we guilty of stinking thinking? I mean, we just look at the world and we think everything is wrong. People say things like, well, I'm sure glad I'm not having to raise my kids in this culture. Well, thank you, Mr. Encouragement, for encouraging young families. Can I tell you this? Young families, listen to me. The same God that was on the throne 100 years ago is on the throne today. Okay? He is. And the same God that helped people not just 100 years ago, but 1,000 years ago. By the way, do you think maybe the families in the Roman Empire might have thought, well, our culture is bad. Well, our government is oppressive. You think maybe they would have reason to think that? Of course. And we could go back throughout history. But God is on the throne. Okay? And so the same God that was alive when Daniel was thrown into the den of lions... When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were thrown into the fiery furnace is the same God that is alive today. So there is hope. You can get your kids to Jesus. You can have a family that pleases God. Why? Because the Spirit of God wants to renew you. He will renew your thoughts and your attitudes. Then he says this, and here's the putting on part. We're to take off the old nature he says, then, put on the new nature, just like you put on a uniform. So get that picture. If you're going to play football, what are you going to do? If you're going to get on the field, they don't let you on the field unless you're wearing your uniform, okay? Uh, so you've got to put on something before you can do something, right? You've got to put on something before you can fully participate. And in the same way, in, uh, in our life, God wants us to be concerned about fashion, the designer, and function, what we do, okay? So he says we can be concerned of both, but we got to take off the old nature, and we got to put on the new nature, created to be like God, truly righteous and holy. And then he gets into some practical aspects of who you are wearing. When you begin to wear the, the new nature, like a coat, like a garment, you take off the, new, the old nature, he says, so stop telling lies. That's pretty direct, isn't it? Quit lying. Stop telling lies. Let us tell our neighbors the truth, for we are all parts of the same body. And please understand what he's saying here. He's not saying be rude. He's not saying be offensive when he says, tell your neighbors the truth. Uh, you know, he's not telling you to make people angry. What he's saying is that we are to speak truth. We're not to be deceptive. 
and we are to have the truth in our life so that we remember that we are a part of the body of Christ. Talk to your neighbors, talk to your family, talk to your church friends, talk to your work associates as if you're talking to Jesus. That's what he's saying. So you stop lying. Then he says, and don't sin by letting anger control you. Boy, do we not live in a culture that lets anger control it? It seems like people are angry about everything. I, look, I realize that some of us struggle more with anger than others. I'm probably one of those. That My wife, when we first got married, she said, you don't have any emotions. And I said, anger is an emotion, <laughs> you know, whether you realize it or not. And and so sometimes by nature, we will struggle with anger. But what he's saying is, don't let that control you. You ever notice that some people, every day they turn on the news, and every day they're in a tizzy. Every day they're ready to fight. Every day they're complaining about stuff. Every day, everything in the world is all bad and against them and so on and so forth, right? Okay. So he says, don't let anger control you. And don't let the sun go down while you are still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. When Kim and I got married, we made a pact. We said, we're not going to go to bed angry, ever. We had a lot of sleepless nights. All right, so, no, I'm kidding. But the fact is, you can't, what he's saying here is deal with it now. Don't let it fester. Sometimes that's what happens to us, right? We let it get down into us and we mull it over and we think about it. It makes us angrier and angrier and angrier. But he says, don't let that happen to you. He says, if you're a thief, quit stealing. Instead, use your hands for good hard work and then give generously to others in need. Don't use foul or abusive language. You know, Those two things, foul language, sometimes we say things we shouldn't say. Sometimes we use words we shouldn't use. I'm guilty of that, okay? But then abusive language, that's, you know, you don't have to be using curse words to have abusive language. You can be ill-spirited toward your spouse. You can be mean toward your children. Now look, I get that, you know, sometimes your kids get on your last nerve, all right? I get it, all right? Um, Kim and I have three children. Thank God they're all grown adults now, and uh, they only make us half as angry as they used to, all right? So, no, I'm just kidding. So, but the, the truth is, you can be abusive, even without taking God's name in vain, even without cursing, you can be abusive in your language, in the way you speak to others. He says, Don't do those things. He says, let everything you say be good and helpful. But wouldn't things change if we just went by that one rule? Let everything you say be good and helpful. I don't know about you, but my grandmother used to say, well, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything at all. Pretty good rule, all right? Um, The truth is, we can build up with our words, with our language. That's what he's saying. Uh, So that your words will be an encouragement to those who hear them. And do not bring sorrow to God's Holy Spirit by the way you live. By the way, if you're wondering what he's referring to, he's referring to the things that he just wrote about, okay? I mean, for example, most of the time when we think about all the things that are going to grieve the Spirit of God, are things that are what we would call the big deals, the big sins, right? Oh, this person is guilty of murder. That grieves the Spirit of God, and I'm sure that does. But interestingly, we don't ever include the sins that he just mentioned in our assessment of where we are, do we? Abusive things, saying things, not being kind, being harsh and harmful, with our words being degrading. He says that grieves the Spirit of God. He says, remember, He has identified you as His own, guaranteeing that you will be saved on the day of redemption. And then He wraps it up. And and boy, get this mouthful that He's saying. Get rid 
of all bitterness. That little word all, you, you know that the New Testament was written originally in Greek. You know what that word all means in Greek? It means all. Get rid of it all. All right. That's what it means. Get rid of all bitterness. Wow. You ever get bitter? We let things fester. We let things just build up. We don't deal with it. We don't forgive. And we get harsh. We can get bitter toward parents. We can get bitter toward family. We can get bitter toward a boss. We can get bitter toward a neighbor that mistreated us. Look, we all deal with this. A number of years ago, uh, I had a neighbor that I got bitter toward. I'm a pastor, okay? I know what you're supposed to do and how you're supposed to forgive. But I really had a hard time. This guy, he basically, in a public forum, we went to this um, neighborhood association meeting, which, in my opinion, are from the pits of hell. All right, that's all I'm saying, all right? I, I don't enjoy going to them. Maybe you're the president of a neighborhood association. Um, say hello to your brother, the devil, for me. Okay, so, uh, no, I, we just, like, we're in this public forum. And this guy called me out because of something that my son did at the pool. And he literally, in front of everybody in that meeting, said that I was a terrible parent. That's a quote. You are a terrible parent. And what I wanted to say is, but I am a great shot. All right. So, but I got kind of angry at the guy, as you can imagine, and um, didn't deal with it. And for literally a couple of years, the guy walked every morning um, before, you know, every the day got started. And often I would see him walking in our neighborhood and now I wouldn't have done this, okay, but it, I would just want you to know it went through my depraved mind that just, boop, you know, driving, boop, you know, boop, you know, it would be an accident. Nobody would know the difference, right? Well, obviously, I wasn't going to run over him, but I will tell you this. I was bitter. I got angry at him. And you know what? The funny thing about my bitterness, every time I saw him, it made me, it made me like want to, it threw up in the back of my mouth a little bit. You know what I mean? He didn't think about me at all. It didn't bother him. He never thought about it. And you know what happens with bitterness? It makes us bitter. It doesn't harm the other person. So he says, get rid of all bitterness and rage and anger and harsh words and slander as well as all types of evil behavior and instead, you want to know the antidote? How do you get rid of the rage? How do you get rid of the bitterness? How do you get better from it? He said, instead, be kind. That is a wonderful antidote. Be kind. You got a problem with somebody? Be kind to them. Somebody you don't like? Be kind. Somebody has offended you? Be kind. Now, why does he say that? He said, be kind, tenderhearted, forgiving one another just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And this takes us back to the story that Jesus told about the man that uh, owed the, the king, we'll call it $20 million. He had, no, he had no money. He had no resources. It didn't matter if he owed $100 or $20 million, he didn't have the ability to pay it back. And the king had compassion on him and forgave him that $20 million of debt. What a day. What a great day, right? But this guy goes out and he has a friend. He has someone that had borrowed, I don't know, roughly 800 bucks from him. And in that day, if you didn't pay your debts, they could throw you into debtor's prison. You didn't get to like charge it on the credit card and then not pay the credit card. You didn't get to file bankruptcy. If you didn't pay your debt, you got thrown into debtor's prison. And so this guy that had just been forgiven $20 million of debt to the king has a buddy that owes him 800 and he grabs him by the throat and throws him on the ground and has him thrown into debtor's prison for a measly 800 bucks. 
And the king heard about it. And he said, oh, this guy is horrible. I forgave him all of this debt, and now he wants to throw his friend into debtor's prison over a measly 800 bucks. Have this man delivered to the debtor's prison. And here's what he said. Uh, and deliver him to the tormentors. The tormentors. You know what that means? I believe it means not, not that if you don't forgive that you're going to hell. I believe what it means is when you don't truly release the bitterness, when you don't forgive from the heart, you know what happens to you? You are tormented. You'll live a tormented life. You'll never get better. It'll affect your health. It will affect your family. It will affect your work. It will affect your relationships. And he says that what you should do instead is be kind. Be kind. And I know the pushback. Sometimes we like, well, I don't feel that way in my heart, so I'm not going to be a hypocrite. You know what's interesting is that when we start practicing the behavior that God tells us to, the emotions follow the behavior. It's not the other way around. Because for most of us, we're like, oh, as soon as I don't hate that guy so much, I'm going to forgive him. That's not what God said. He said, start with the action. Start with the obedience. And when you do, eventually, the feelings will follow. You want to know how to stop hating somebody? Start being kind. Start uh, letting them know that you're going to forgive them just like Jesus has forgiven you. You say, well, you don't know what that person did to me. Don't have to know. God knows. And what he said was, if we will follow this, then things will get better in our life. Well, I realize that was a long introduction and a long uh, reading of the scripture. But I want to just answer the questions. How do you put on the new nature? You got to put on... Christ, you got to take off the old nature. So the question is, who are you wearing? How are you living? Are you living in a way that pleases God? So how do you put on the new nature? Let me just give you the thoughts quickly. Number one, you got to choose. The idea that he gives us this command to take off the old nature and to put on the new nature tells us that we can decide. We can make a choice. This is something that we have some control over. So if you want to put on the new nature, you want to stop hating, you want to start uh, living uh, a, a, a bitter free, bitterness-free life, what do you do? You make a choice. You decide. I, I love, I, I've talked with people before that have had tremendous trauma in their life. And just you ask them, how can you be so happy? You've had this terrible loss, and you could imagine. And to a person, they say, well, because I choose to be happy. And, and I've got this written in my prayer journal that I'll be as happy as I choose to be. And that's true with you as well. So you get to make a choice. Now, that does not mean that we have to do all this on our own, and it does not mean that living the Christian life is simply uh, up to your own self-effort. But he's saying that we depend on the Holy Spirit, that God will help us when we ask. So you get to make a choice. You got to decide. You know why some people don't want to get rid of the bitterness or get uh, in the forgiving spirit? You know why? Because they love their hatred too much. They love their bitterness too much. They, they, they live in it. It's where they live. But you get to choose. Number two, you get to learn. The interesting thing is, he said, but this isn't what you learned about Christ. The idea that uh, goes along with putting on who you're wearing, putting on Christ, taking off the new nature, you get to choose, number one, but you can get better at it. You can learn. And so the idea that you, well, because my emotions are not uh, necessarily 
in the right place. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. I don't feel like forgiving that person. And if I said, I forgive you, I wouldn't really feel it in my heart. So therefore, I don't know that I mean it. And therefore, I'm not going to be a hypocrite and say that. Did you know that God gives you a pattern, a plan here? You can, you can ask. You can choose. Forgiveness is a choice. It's not an emotion. I want you to hear me on that. Forgiveness is not an emotion. Now, emotions go along with it. And an unforgiving spirit carry, carries a lot of negative emotions. You know what happens when you start to forgive, though? A lot of relief comes. A lot of joy. Suddenly, you'll find yourself happier than you used to be. And so uh, you can learn to do this. It's a learned behavior. You can learn to take off the old nature and to put on the new. And then finally, you can change. Once again, this is not dependent upon your effort. This is dependent upon the Holy Spirit of God. Now, he gives us this contrast to help us understand what we're dealing with. The old nature... Here's what he says comes along with wearing that old nature. Hopelessness. Well, do we not have a lot of hopelessness in this culture? Confusion. A lot of confusion, isn't there? Darkness. Man, I've never seen a day in which more people are facing darkness. And I'll even just use a very popular modern term like mental health. There are a lot of people that are really struggling more so than I've ever seen in my almost 60 years of existence. Uh, there are people that are drifting. It seems like they have no purpose. They have no anchor. Uh, people have a closed mind. You ever notice that it's really difficult today to talk to people? Used to, you could disagree politically on some things and you could still be friends. Doesn't hardly seem to be the case anymore, does it? You get closed-minded, and then you get a hard heart, and then you get a seared conscience. You know what I mean by seared conscience? You ever touch something and, uh, to, to heat, take a piece of meat and put it on a hot stove or put it on a fire? You know what that happens? It sears it. It burns it. You know what happens to us? We get a seared conscience. Let, let me tell you what I mean by that. Um, the first time you say no to the Lord, maybe he's convicting you. Maybe it's about salvation. And he's like, you hear the gospel. You hear somebody praying for you. And you're like, yes, I need that. But in your heart, you're like, well, I'm not going to do it right now. I'll do it later. And you put it off. And then the next time that the Lord deals with you, it gets a little bit easier to say no. Or, or maybe it's something that God's speaking to you about stopping doing that you, you know you shouldn't be doing. And the first time you think about it, man, it kind of bothers you. And you're like, well, I, you know, I'll put that off. And then the next time you think about it, it doesn't bother you as much. And the next time you think about it, it hardly bothers you at all. That's what we mean by seared conscience. That after a while, you stop responding to the prompting of the Holy Spirit of God. That's what... The old nature produces. Then he says, on the other hand, we're to put on the new nature. That new person, when we get saved, you put on Christ. Here's what he said happens. A renewed attitude. I don't know about you, but I need my attitude renewed a lot. Okay? Amen for you, not me, right? All right, so you're saying amen, and I need a new attitude? Okay. No, I need a renewed attitude, and, and so do all of us. We have to... Let God renew our faith, renew our attitude. Righteousness and holiness. In other words, things begin to get better in your life. Because you're no longer living that way, you get less stress. Things look brighter. You get happier times. I mean, listen, there's so much benefit to living with the new man, the new spirit that God has put in you, putting on the new person. He says, then you get to be honest, honest. 
How many times do we want to just lie? And, and by honest, he's not talking about, you know, when someone says, do these shorts make me look fat? And you just like, you know, tear them up. No, that's not what he's talking about. Okay. By the way, only women ask that question. All right. I've never heard a man ask another man, do these shorts make me look fat? You know why? Because the guy would tell him, it ain't the shorts, buddy. It's that big old behind that's in those shorts. That's what makes you look fat. And so uh, he says we can be honest. We can be controlled by joy rather than anger. Man, wouldn't that be a better way to live? Not being controlled by anger? He says that you get a good work ethic and a good work-life balance. He said, you know, quit stealing. And let your hands work for positive so you can help other people. Uh, you get a good work ethic, a good work-life balance. You become generous. You have a change in the way that you speak to others. You'll stop using foul and abusive language. Then you get God's approval. Then you begin to have emotional health. Then you'll have kindness toward others. And before you know it, you'll have a forgiving spirit. And what happens is the more I'm aware of the spirit of God, no matter what happens to me, no matter how much people offend me, no matter how much people do the wrong thing toward me, I am now more willing to forgive them. Why? Because I remember that Jesus has forgiven me. Does that make sense? And so what God says is, and he asks the question, who are you wary? Are you worried about fashion? Well, that's concerned with the designer. Our designer says we're to wear the new person. Are you concerned more about functionality? That is how you behave, how you act, what you do in response to that. We are to be concerned with both the designer and the function. And when we put on the new nature, when we put on Christ, God says, Tremendous change will happen. Here's what I want to challenge you to do uh, this week. Start every day by asking the Holy Spirit to help you put on the new nature. Do that every morning. Not at the end of the day, but at the beginning of the day. Before you start, before you even have your first cup of coffee. All right, You start when you get out of bed, Lord, help me to put on the new nature today. If you'll start asking God that, He'll begin to help you and you'll begin to put on the new nature. And then you put these things into action. Release the anger and bitterness. Forgive someone. Speak encouraging words to someone this week. Uh, maybe your spouse. Maybe your family. Maybe your coworkers. Maybe a neighbor. A fellow student. And then practice kindness. And watch how it transforms their life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd help us all to put on Christ today. Help us to take off the old nature and to put on Jesus. Lord, you asked that question of us, who are you wearing? And help us to wear the new nature. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I want to say to all those joining us online, maybe today uh, you want to pray to receive Christ. Can I encourage you to say something like this? You see, you can try to have this transformation in your behavior and your emotions and your attitude, but it won't work until you receive Christ. Say something like this. Dear God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe that He died on the cross and rose from the grave, and I believe that He will forgive my sins if I ask. And right now, I'm asking you to forgive me, to make me new, to help me follow you. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll pray that prayer, mark it at the bottom of the screen. Let us know that you prayed to receive Christ today, and then that way we can help you take your next step. If that's true for you in the room today, please take the next step card and the red card there and put your name on it and check at the bottom that you prayed to receive Christ. And uh, I hope that you will do that. Let us know today. Well, speaking of that next step card, make sure to drop that in. If you're new to our church, if you've not filled out one of these cards before, please take a moment and fill this out. 
I'm going to ask our ushers to come and we can drop our next step cards. If you want to put a prayer request in, that's fine. But ushers, would you come and you can go ahead and start passing the buckets once you get there. There are four ways that you can give. You can give in the bucket when it passes. Uh, You can give online at stillwaters.online. Stillwaters.online. All right. Or you can text the number 84321. 84321. Uh, Or uh, you can give on the church app. That's the way Kim and I give. It's the most convenient way. If you don't know how to have the church app or you don't have it, there's a little teal colored card in a, in a, in a pocket on the right as you walk out and uh, you can learn how to download that app to your phone. It's very convenient, keeps up with your giving for the whole year and I think you'll really enjoy having that app, all right? Now, uh, just a couple things before we're dismissed. Um, Starting next week, we start a brand new series, uh, and I'm titling it Get Plugged In. And for the next several weeks, we're going to talk about how you can get plugged in at our church. Kim talked about it earlier. We're going to do Serve Our Neighbor. We've got some tremendous things that we're going to do uh, to reach out to some of our neighbors around here. And then uh, Serve Your World. We're going to talk about how that we're going to be able to help children in South Africa and with medicine in the Dominican Republic. We're going to give you an opportunity to do that. We've got all kinds of things that are going to be happening. We're going to recognize and appreciate our volunteers. Uh, and it's just going to be a wonderful, wonderful series. I hope you will be here next week, uh, the 930 and 11 service. And I think that um, I think you'll really be benefiting from uh, this. And I think it's going to be a great, great series. All right. Well, thank you for being here with us today.